tēnā koutou katoa. Nau mai hoki mai ki te kaupapa o tēnei wā, ko Jane Ritimana toku ingoa. Welcome back to the second session of day two of The Point 2022. It's so good to have you all here uh, this morning with us in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, this session is with um, our international keynote, Dave Birch. And just before we start, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors again for helping us put on The Point 2022, the awesome delegates that um, have been part of our conference for the last two days. And I'd especially like to thank our payments education sponsor, PayEd, for this morning's session and helping us to bring Dave uh, back to Aotearoa. Uh, Dave is an author, speaker, principal at 15 megabytes, and uh, one of our uh, panelists yesterday calls himself the godfather of fintech, but Dave really is the go global godfather of all things digital money and digital currency and digital identity. And Dave's here today to talk to us about Tap to Prove. In today's world with the internet, um, data security has become a major issue. And every day it seems there's a report of a new breach or new fraud and um, people are getting smarter and smarter in how they um, defraud others and, and go about their business. And so Dave has got a vast um, background and verifiable credentials, digital identity, he knows all about this and he is here with us this morning. Kia ora Dave, welcome to Aotearoa again, it's nice to have you here. Thank you so and, much for inviting um, me down James, yeah, it's, it's absolutely lovely here. It's so, always so fantastic and um, for those of you that were with us yesterday, uh, Dave and Brett King were fabulous actually, <laughs> weren't you? And your, You're very kind. And your double act, but today it is a single show, a solo show here today and you're going to talk to us about Tap to Pro. So obviously uh, day. Absolutely. Yes, thanks very much, Jane. Um, it, it, it actually is a lovely day in Auckland today as it happens, so that was wonderful. So um, what I'm going to talk about this morning is, um, is I, want to, I want to put forward, uh, uh, you know, an optimistic, you know, we, we moan a lot of the time about this, well, I, I moan a lot of the time about the state of internet security. Um, so I want to highlight a couple of things where I think there's some progress being made and where people can begin to steer some strategies to, to take advantage of, of, of one or two changes. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, well, you can see, we don't need to talk about that, let's, go on. let's get on with it. So, so my starting point is I've got a bit bored with people saying um, that uh, digital identity, you know, people, they don't think, that is a solution looking for a problem, you know. But, but actually the thing with digital identity is, it's a solution to, to, to millions of problems. It's, it's become the missing piece of the jigsaw. It's the, it's the foundation for, for what a lot of, not just payments, but for a lot of, in, and, and, and we lack the digital identity infrastructure that we need. Um, and, and I want to highlight one or two things that are taking us forward that are positive. So I know a lot of people in the audience will be bored with seeing this, but I always want to start by saying, when I talk about digital identity, I don't, I'm not talking about something sort of vague and generic. I don't, I don't, when I say digital identity, I mean something very specific, which is this bridge between the, between the real and the virtual. You know, digital identity, it's a, to, you know, to me, it's a, it's a concrete, solid thing. And I use this model, the three domain identity model, as a way of making that sort of clear to people. The three domains are the identification domain, which binds the you know, if, if you're thinking technically, it sort of binds private keys to things in the real world. The authentication domain, which is to do with the control of those keys, and the authorization domain, which binds public keys to, um, to facts about people, if you like. So, so the first point is, when I say digital identity, I don't mean anything sort of waffly or generic. I mean something absolutely specific, and I'm going to use the three domain identity model to talk through it. The sort of starting point is that well, well, actually, I mean, everything is a huge mess. And every day that goes by, you see another data breach, another massive fraud. You know, fraud in the UK is completely out of control. The, the scamdemic, uh, as they call it. We've ended up in this odd situation where nobody knows whether anything is real or not. So, you know, I, you know, I get a message what, I mean, there's one on here from like, that was from PayPal, which even I almost, I mean, I, I think I'm kind of aware of these kind of things. Even I almost fell for it because you just you can't tell. And, and it's such a mess that even when you do log in, you, you can't tell whether you're dealing with the real people or not. It, it, 
And one of the reasons is, is that everywhere you go, it's completely different. There are different visual cues, there are different pathways. There's different kinds of progressive disclosure. There's no sort of common, you, you know, you don't know where you are and you don't know what you're doing. One of my favorite examples actually is on the screen here. This is from, this is from UK Finance. So I, I went to the UK Finance website because I wanted to get some statistics about what fraud is looking like at the moment. And so on the UK, <laughs> on the UK Finance website, there's a report about fraud rising, government action needed. And on top of it, you can just see there's a scam warning because it turns out people have been putting out scam emails purporting to be from UK Finance um, about getting some sort of pandemic loans. I can't remember what it was. And, and, and actually the solutions to all of this are also a bit of a mess because they're also very variable. So for example, here's one I, f I forgot. I was trying to log in to change something on Avis, <coughs> change something on my booking. I'd forgotten my password, of course. I mean, most of these websites, to be honest, they should probably just take me straight to the you've, I've forgotten my password page and just bypass the, the first page. And all of a sudden that pops up login with Amazon. And I'm, wait, wait, is that a real thing or is that, a scam thing or is has somebody put that on that page am i looking at the real avis website um you know even people who are well informed you know i count myself as kind of well informed anyway, anyway I mean, the point is it's a huge mess and and fraud is getting worse and scams are out of control and something has to be done about it really uh and that something is not i mean it's all very well talking about consumer education and and so on but I honestly, you know, the solution is not, you know, lecturing people about, oh, you've got to be more careful with your passwords and, you know, be careful on things you click on, all this sort of thing. I mean, whatever, right? We as the industry have to make some infrastructure to, to help, like just telling consumers to, you know, be watch out for scams or whatever is not, is not, that's not good enough. We need a change in the infrastructure. And you know what I'm going to say, this is where digital identity comes in. We need a change in the infrastructure to protect people, not, uh, you know, not consumer education. Uh, and, and as I've just mentioned, so you know what the solution is, which is digital identity. Unfortunately, nobody listens to me about this sort of thing. Uh, I, I've, in fact, I remember presenting about it at the point about six years ago or something like that. You know, no one pays any attention to me. Uh, but fortunately, um, the McKinsey Technology Trends Outlook 2022 just came out uh, a little while back and I was really interested to see that they've identified what they call digital trust uh, as one of their key areas of focus so it's, it's interesting this message is is reaching the management consultants and then hopefully on from there on into industry and they say what well, they've got the, the most noteworthy technologies uh, they highlight are passwordless authentication and self-sovereign identity so I thought Actually, that's good. So let's, let's look at those as two examples of technologies where we can really change things. Um, so, because I mean, the point is, Jane, we, you know, we want technologies that are practical and scalable and going, it's all very well talking about hypothetical things, but we want to talk about what's actually gonna happen. So let's, so McKinsey say, uh, these are the noteworthy things, who am I to disagree? So let's have a look at those and see uh, if we can be optimistic about it. Now on the first one, this thing about passwordless authentication, that really has taken a step forward because we're now in the situation where Apple, Microsoft and Google have all agreed to interoperate uh, using the FIDO standards. And so what's, what's now known as pass keys is going to come into general use. And so this is the idea where, you know, basically, you, you know, you log in on your PC or your laptop or something and, and then you put your thumb on your phone and you're logged in. You don't have to remember a password and the security is handled by keys and certificates and digital signatures, all sorts of things that you don't need to know anything about, right? So, as, I mean, you know, I look at my phone, I do the face ID, I'm logged in. And for a great many people, um, actually, the degree of, I mean, people will do this because it's convenient, um, but actually it is a big step forward in security as well. So this is good news that this is happening. And if you want to look at what, uh, you know, evidence from the marketplace uh, that this is moving forward, you know, I, I happen to use one password as my password manager. Um, you know, there are lots of different products in this space, uh, but I noticed that um, one password has just bought Passage to do the, um, 
to do the passkey. So even the, one of the biggest password managers is already moving into this passkey space. And that sort of suggests to me that um, actually that's going to move quite quickly in the mass market. So as I've said there, the days, the days of me trying to remember my favorite breed. I'm using the dog example because at the Digital Identity New Zealand conference, um, whenever that was about three months ago or something like that, uh, I used a real example because I've been trying to change my flight details, but because I was logging in, I'm guessing, because I was logging in from somewhere I'd never logged into before, I go to change my flight details and I get a screen which asks me for my favorite breed of dog, which I must have set, <laughs> I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I've forgotten. Anyway, the point is, we're not going to have to do that anymore. That's all going away. So, so that is a very good thing to be optimistic about. That's a very good starting point. Um, and uh, but it only solves one part that solves that middle bit authentication and that's good but it's only part of the problem we still have this same problem that on the internet no one knows that you're a toaster pretending to be a dog pretending to be my bank for example so a good step but now let's move on to the so password authentication yes absolutely and that's happening and that's real but let's move on to the second part of what they said which is, which is um, self-sovereign identity. Now, this is where things get a bit more complicated because self-sovereign identity, the, the interesting part of that, if you think about that three domain identity diagram, the identification bit is not the interesting part. The interesting part here is the right-hand side, the authorization part. And that's about not who you are, but what you are. It's about not identifying, but authorizing. And this is a crucial distinction, which is really important um, in, in, in future uh, security. I don't, you know, in order to do a transaction with you, I don't want to know who you are. I want to know what you are. You know, are, you a, are you a customer of my bank? Are you a company director? Are you even a person? That's the kind of thing we're moving towards. Now, um, on the issue, so, so McKinsey, you know, they have self-sovereign identity, and, but really self-sovereign identity is actually really two things. It's, it's the um, identifiers, or you know, decentralized or distributed identifiers of some kind. It's the identifiers and it's the credentials. It's the facts about um, the owners of those identifiers that are attested to. So I wanna take those two things apart. And I'm not really going to talk about the identification side of things much. In many ways, the sort of, because I mean, we've already seen through the pandemic, the acceleration in digital onboarding. Um, you know, there are lots of companies that are very good at this now. So you can scan your password and, and uh, scan your passport and they can tell whether it's a fake and all this sort of thing. Um, and that sort of stuff is quite good. So I don't want to spend any time really talking about that. And also, the reason I also don't want to spend much time talking about that is because the sort of fundamental idea of self-sovereign identity, which is you put people in charge of their identities, I think is a really bad idea for the same reason putting people in charge of sorting out their passwords is a really bad idea. I mean, it sounds good. So you said, well, you know, we'll, 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 we'll self-sovereign and we'll put people in charge of their identities. But if you put people in charge of their identities, they'll give them away to Facebook to take part in a stupid quiz or because somebody gave them a Snickers bar in the street or something. Like putting people in charge of their identities is not a good idea. In fact, it's a very bad idea because most people, and I include myself in this, are really not responsible enough or organized enough or you know, to, to actually man. I mean, I lose my car keys three times every, like putting me in charge of mine, no thank you. So this is, why, this is why I label custodial SSID. So in other words, using the technology of self-sovereign identity, but without me having to look after the keys. The keys are safely locked up. You know, I, I would imagine in my bank would be a good first choice for this sort of thing. So that's why I say custodial SSID rather than SSID. But actually, I don't want to spend much time talking about that. What I want to talk about more is the credential side of things. Now, um, there are some credentials, uh, i.e. facts about me that are attested to by trusted third parties, which are really, really valuable. And um, I think what's been going on with Twitter and Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter sort of, you know, proves this, proves this point, really. So 
you know, so he said one of the reasons why Twitter was problematic was because there were so many bots on the system. Like you couldn't even tell if something is a person or not. And, um, you know, in many ways that could be the most valuable credential of the sort of future internet age is just knowing whether you're interacting with a person or not. So that very basic credential of this is a real person is fundamentally very important. Now, there are, obviously there are, there are many different ways of doing this kind of thing. Um, I would have thought actually, what with all this talk about open banking, open banking is a good example of where you could use the bank account, the bank KYC and leverage it in very easy ways. So in other words, if Twitter wants to know if I'm a real person, one of the easiest ways to do that is to bounce me to my bank, you know, through open banking and get me to log in. And then the bank can send back some, you know, some cryptographic token, which would function as that credential. Like, so, so in other words, Twitter wouldn't have to work out whether I'm a real person or not, because the bank's already worked out whether I'm a real person or not. So since the bank knows whether I'm a real person or not, why not use the bank credential? Like, in any case, it's none of Twitter's business who I am, really. But um, uh, although I, and actually, there's another reason for doing that, which I did notice this morning. The New York Times is saying that Twitter has filed to move into the payments business now with Mr. Musk in charge. And so the link between Twitter and open banking is really interesting in that space as well. Uh, but anyway, the point is, a, a, even a simple credential like that, that this is a real person could be incredibly valued, incredibly valuable in the online space. And that's just the most basic one. But it has to work in the real world, not in the sort of, uh, in the sort of academic sense of it. So suppose I've now got a private key and suppose now the fact that I'm a real person is bound to that public key. In other words, there's a, there's a credential which could be stored on my phone or could be off in the cloud somewhere or wherever. So when I need to prove that I'm a person, you know what happens, you know, I present that credential, the credential's got a public key in it, whoever I'm presenting it to creates a, cryptogra a, a cryptographic challenge by encrypting using that public key. The only person that can answer that challenge is the person that controls the corresponding private key, i.e. me. I respond to it. And so now they know that I am the real owner of that credential. I am a real person. And all of this happens under the hood, of course. I mean, you, you'd never, you, customers don't need to know anything about keys and credentials and so on. We'll come back to that a bit later on. But the point is, we know how all this stuff works. But to work and scale in the mass market, it's got to work properly. And so the first... <laughs> You know, the first and most obvious sort of question about this sort of thing, well, okay, that sounds great. What happens if I drop my phone down the toilet? So this is exactly why I don't want to be responsible for looking after the private keys, because if I drop my phone down the toilet, what I want to do is go and get a new phone, and then I want to get the keys reloaded by the bank uh, into my phone. And since banks know how to securely transport private keys and install them in secure harbor, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, I, 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 hope I'm, I hope I'm telling people stuff they already know here, because this, this should be well known to everybody that banks know how to do this sort of stuff. So let's, let's suppose we can move that a little bit forward then. So, so let's suppose now, you know, I've got my phone. My phone is storing some credentials about me. You know, I am a real person. I'm over 18 or whatever. And we have something that works technically. Um, with these keys and certificates that I was just talking about. I've, I've started to, you know, that, that, that only gets us so far in the real world. The fact we have something that works technically, which is going to be infrastructure, so we don't need to explain to consumers how it works, it's just there for them to work. Yeah, how does that work in practice? And this is where I want to introduce a new word into the space. It's a word that comes from the social anthropologists. But this is what I've been thinking we need to do to digital identity to move it forward. And that word is ceremony. So ceremony means in, in, this, in this context, ceremony means that the participants are following a sort of ritual, they know the steps, they know what to do without thinking about it. And if, if something's wrong, if something doesn't work, if something's out of place, they, they would realize what is the ceremony um, 
around using this passwordless authentication and verifiable credentials in real transactions. And I, and I think, to be honest, Jane, this is the bit of the challenge we've got to now. So, so we know that the technology works and there are standards evolving and, um, and thanks to the mobile phone and other things, we now have this kind of secure infrastructure developing. But how you use it, I think, has become problematic. And, the, and what I mean by this is there are some things I do online. I, you know, I log into something and it sends me an email and I have to get a code out of an email and put it in. There's other things I log into and they send me a, an SMS one-time password, which, by the way, shouldn't be allowed. I mean, I've certainly, one of the first acts of my benign dictatorship will be to ban the use of SMS. For The, the idea that it's any form of security at all is... is is ridiculous. I get spoofed SMS messages every single day. Hello, this is the government. We've got some COVID money from you. You know, hello, this is this is FedEx. We tried to deliver your parcel. You weren't out. Hello, this is your bank. Hello, this is HMRC. You haven't paid your VAT returns yet. Actually, that one turned out to be real. But, um, you know, you can't blame me for just deleting them all when they come in. And criminals exploit this. Criminals know that customers don't know what to expect. So when customers get a text message which says, oh, this is your bank, we need to check this transaction, they've absolutely no basis for knowing whether that's real or not. And because people are quite trusting, they generally assume that it's real. If I get an email that says, hello, this is PayPal, uh, you know, we've got this special offer for you, I mean, or whatever. But because people, because because there is no ceremony, because there is no common, you know, pe people can be fooled. And, and this is not because they're stupid, uh, you know, far from it, in fact. I mean, you, you, see, you see, you know, very intelligent people being taken in by these scams because the scammers know how to take people through these different pathways. And as a consumer, I don't know what to expect. So if... So if they tell me you've got to put this code in through a text message or you've got to ring this number or you've got to do this email or you've got to go to this website, how should I know whether that's real? So I do it, you know. What, what we need is to move towards a common ceremony around these digital identity issues where people can feel comfortable, or as Rachel Botsman said yesterday, comfortable about their relationship with the unknown. Um, and at the same time, spot if something's odd. So how can we create that kind of consistent interaction, ceremony if you like, which will, be, uh, which will give that confidence, will work at scale and will be practical to implement using the two technologies we've just been talking about? So, uh, so, you know, and I've got an example here, which is a thing that I almost fell for from, from PayPal. It's not from PayPal, of course, but it looked plausible. So, so let, let's, 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 pick a, let's pick a practical and real example to show you what I mean. So, um, and this is a true story. So uh, an acquaintance of mine went on holiday to uh, an African country uh, with her with her boyfriend actually and they're they're very keen on scuba diving so they went somewhere where you could go scuba diving I won't, I won't name the country and uh, and uh, the, like the day after they got there they both were afflicted with with terror I mean I hate to bring this up so early in the morning but terrible stomach issues of a kind which are not unknown to travelers in um, in some countries and, uh, and this was so bad, they actually couldn't leave their hotel room. They were stuck in their hotel room. They couldn't leave the room. And this went on for another day. And so they called down to the desk, you know, to get some medical help. And, um, and basically, and, you know, and the, the cure for this sort of thing, well, it's not really a cure. I mean, basically what they do is they come and put in an intravenous uh, line. And I think it's just basically salt and sugar, isn't it? And water they put in just to stop you from dehydrating. So anyway, so they had these put in uh, for a day and then after another day, they actually felt better and they finally got to go scuba diving for the last couple of days of their holiday. And when they came back to the UK, they filled out their insurance forms to claim for the medical expenses. 
and the insurance company refused the claim on the basis that the person who'd been treating them wasn't a doctor. It was just a mate of some guy who worked for the hotel, you know. I mean, he'd done a great job. I mean, they got better, but he wasn't a doctor. And, and, th and there's maybe people like, well, how would you know whether someone's a doctor? I mean, this is a good example. Like, if someone, times up, if someone says they're a policeman at your door, um, you know, there's a bit problems in the UK recently around some, some terrible issues around this sort of thing. How do you know whether someone's really a policeman? They're talking in London about putting QR codes on the police warrant cards so you can scan the QR code. But I mean, f I mean first of all, QR codes can be copied by anybody. Um, but also, you know, the police lose God knows how many thousands of warrant cards every year anyway. So that's not in itself. So how do you know it's a doc? Or in, and I, I chose this example from, from Helen's cartoon here because I'm, I'm English. So my terrible fear is not about unlicensed doctors, but about unlicensed dentists. Uh, it's, a, it's a weirdly English thing. But every time I read a story in the newspaper about an Eastern European plumber who comes over and sets himself up as a dentist and starts drilling holes in people, it's, oh, I can't even bear thinking about that sort of thing. But, and by the way, I'm not making that up. That actually happens all the time, right? Not just dentists. There was a thing in the papers in, in the UK a couple of months back about a guy who'd been flying planes for British Airways and uh, EasyJet, I think, and it turned out he wasn't a properly qualified pilot. So, I mean, I think the dentist, but you get my general point. The point is, this isn't just about me logging into banks. There's a much bigger picture here. This much more generalized issue of how you prove and get, how, how, how you can prove things about yourself, but how other people can prove things about themselves to you. So we need a symmetrical infrastructure that would deal with both of those issues. It's one thing for me to go to the dentist and the dentist to, to you know, I touch something on my phone, I, it's Dave Birch and this is my date of birth and whatever. Um, but at the same time, I want to know it's a real dentist. And how do I do that? We need a symmetrical infrastructure that, that takes care of this sort of thing. But it's got to be done at that kind of level where, where consumers and actually dentists don't need to know about how any of this works under the hood. So if you think about what would happen in a practical example like that, um, I've got an appointment with the dentist. I've got a smart wallet on my phone, right, which is storing my credentials and money and tokens and identity and all sorts of other things. So, I go to the, so, my, so I've got an appointment with the dentist. I go to the dentist. So my phone is looking for a credential that says you know, uh, is a UK registered authorized dentist. So my phone, so I, let's, let's imagine we're doing this with phones. So I go and check in at the dentist uh, surgery and let's say the, the receptionist holds her phone against my phone for even, let's, let's do it using NFC rather than QR codes. So, so think about what's really got to happen to make that all work under the hood. So my phone has to say, I'm looking for this credential is a registered dentist, okay? And then the dentist phone has got to say, actually, I have two credentials like that. One that comes from, I don't know, the local authority and one that comes from the medical authorities or something. And then my phone would say, oh, I haven't got the key for the medical authority, so I can't check that, but I've got the key for the local authority. So, okay, can you send me the local authority credential? And then, um, and then the, they send that credential over and then I, and then, but yeah, but is it really you? You know, so I take the public key out and I do the challenge and I send that back to you. And then the woman at the dentist, let's say, puts her thumb on it. Um, and, uh, and yes, that's, that's really them. So she really is, she really is my dentist. Um, and then, you know, and it's also asking, am I really Dave Birch? So I put my thumb on it. And there's a lot been going on there that uses really solid cryptography to make sure this is all correct. But to the two participants in the ceremony, like think about what happens in, in ceremonial terms, right? We walk in, we touch the phones together, we put our thumbs or our faces or whatever, and either on my phone, I either get a picture of my dentist, if she is indeed a real dentist, or I get a big red cross. That's the end of the story. Like there's no more, like at the user interface. I mean, either I see her picture or I see a red cross that's it. it can't be anything more complicated than that, otherwise it won't scale into the mass market. So we have to try to find a way to take the technologies that McKinsey was talking about there, which they're correct to talk about, and fit those into a ceremony 
that makes sense to the users, while we as technologists make sure that the infrastructure, the seat belts, if you like, are, are all correct. Now that's, that's a lot to ask for in one go, but the reason why I said this is gonna be an optimistic presentation is because I think we can see the steps in the right direction with, with this shift towards password authentication, the standardization of verifiable credentials and mobile driving licenses and things like that. We, we can begin to think as an industry um, and obviously, I mean, obviously I think that Payments NZ would be an obvious coordinator for this kind of thinking. We can begin to think what that ceremony should look like. Um, and of course, the people that we should be asking to help us to guide us through that are, you know, social anthropologists and, and, and other, but like not technologists. Like we, we can, whatever ceremony they want, we can do it. We have all of the technologies that we need. But, but we need to coordinate with a broader range of people to make that work. So can we make that work practically? Well, the answer is yes, we can. And here it is working actually 10 years ago. So Jerry Fishenden, who a very smart guy, used to be Microsoft. Jerry and I were on the Home Office Advisory Group together for a while to do with ID cards and things like that. He's a very thoughtful guy. Jerry said, um, look, in the pandemic, we educated customers on tap to pay. Can't we educate them on tap to prove? And I thought that was such an interest. Yeah, tap to prove. Like it's, it's got to be that simple for people to make the whole thing work. Why can't we have tap to prove? And then I remembered, uh, this is a project from 10 years ago. This is, uh, this is using an early, actually it's a Nokia 6131. This is using one of the early NFC phones to do tap to prove actually at a pop festival. So this was a pop festival in London um, and people had wristbands and the wristbands had chips in them. Um, and some of the chips, you know, some of the wristbands you could go into, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was, there was like a VIP area and there was like a backstage area. So the, the bouncers essentially had these phones, just, I mean, they were standard off the shelf phones with the software loaded into them. And so when people wanted to come in, you tap the phone on the wristband and it would either go red or green and you let the person through or not. It's 10 years ago, this is all working. So I know that we can make that work, you know, with, with the, the even better technology we have now, but there it is working, you know, all those years ago. So, so what am I saying there? So what I'm saying is the way that we, the way that we think about um, digital identity is, is slightly, so, so we think about digital identity in the sense that we take our driving license and we make a digital version of it and we do the exact same things with that that we did with our actual driving license. And that's not really the right way of thinking. Um, I think this point about symmetry is really important, Jane. Like one of, you know, it isn't just about me proving that I'm me to the bank. It's about the bank proving that they're the bank to me. And we need an infrastructure that handles both of those things. But we need something a bit more than that. And this is where the concept, I think, of counterintuitive, what I call counterintuitive cryptography comes into play. Over the last few years, coming from the world of of you know bitcoins and self-sovereign identity and blockchains and all that sort of thing we have a, we have these new cryptographic toolkits available to us that we didn't have before um, which to you know regulators and legislators sound counterintuitive so this idea that you can i mean to use the canonical example that everybody uses you know going into a bar and proving that you're over 18 rather than showing your date of birth or your age now, if you can only think of identity in terms of driving licenses and filing cards, and you know, that seems a bit odd. Like, how can you prove that you're over 18 without disclosing the actual age? Well, this is where technologies like uh, zero-knowledge proofs, homomorphic encryption, cryptographic blinding, that's where these sort of things come into play. We have new tools in the toolkit, which mean we can share these facts about people uh, without sharing any personally identifiable information. And, and, and these are extremely valuable techniques if we can fit them in to this ceremony that I'm talking about. And I'll give you a couple of examples to illustrate why it's so powerful. 
I know you're not supposed to have favorite data breaches, but you sort of can't help it because there's big ones come along every week. So a couple of weeks ago, my favorite data breach was Optus. I'm not picking on them, but you know, it was just a massive data breach that everybody was reading about in the papers. And I can't remember the exact statistics, but I think in essence, everybody's personal details were stolen um, from Optus. And I remember reading a thing in one of the papers, can't remember which one it was, but I remember seeing a statement from a spokesman who said, well, um, you know, what was taken was people's name, address, date of birth, social security number, passport details. Um, but fortunately, no, it actually, but you know, luckily no financial information was stolen. Well, that's good. So they've only got my name and address and social security number and date of birth and a copy of my passport, but no financial details were stolen. So that's okay. It was laughable, of course. There was a big data breach in Turkey a couple of years ago when a cryptocurrency exchange was, was hacked. Well, well, I say it was hacked. I mean, the, the CEO mysteriously went missing, as did all of the blockchain, or all of the Bitcoin. Oh my God, we've been hacked. But what was stolen wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just some Bitcoins. What was stolen were copies of the identity cards for millions of Turkish people. And you start to think, why were my passport details stolen from Optus? Why were people's ID card details stolen from a Turkish cryptocurrency exchange? And the answer, of course, is because the government made them. And this illustrates the point about the difference between personal information and proofs about personal information. If you want to know that I'm Australian, for example, there's no reason on earth why the passport agency can't provide a cryptographic proof that I'm Australian without disclosing my passport number or details or any of that sort of stuff. If you want to know that I have an account with Barclays Bank, Barclays Bank is perfectly capable of providing a cryptographic token that proves that I'm with Barclays Bank, doesn't contain any personally identifiable information whatsoever. Like all, there's no reason to store all this data about people because actually what you need is the f like, you don't need to store my date of birth. You just need to store the token that proves I'm over 18. And that means if you get hacked, which is all the time apparently, um, none of my personal data goes missing. Only those tokens get stolen. And those tokens are useless to people because I have the corresponding private key and nobody else does. So we're in a situation where, uh, where things are absolutely out of control, worse than they ever were. But there are a couple of classes of technology which are making a difference right now and, and, and can do some amazing things, which, which you couldn't do with the old kind of technologies that we had before. But my view is that we need to sort of shift the focus slightly and start looking at the ceremony of using those new technologies. So how can we get them in practice? And those ceremonies need to be consistent across channels. So in other words, if I walk into the bar, I tap my phone on something, under the hood, my phone is, is this person entitled to ask how old I am? Are they a registered bar, blah, blah, blah. And the bar is like, is this person over 18? Have they been barred from this place before? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of this is visible to me or to the barman. I just tap it, I put my thumb on it. Either he sees my face or he sees a red cross. But the same thing should be true online. If I, if I log into you know, somewhere to buy some booze, and I've got to prove that I'm over 18, it should be the same experience. I log into the website, something pops up on my phone, I put my thumb on it, it's either my face or a big red cross. So the ceremony should be consistent across those interfaces because otherwise fraudsters will step in and exploit the gaps. Now, because of the technology we have available to us now to support this, by which I of course mean things like verifiable credentials, we can actually have quite sophisticated interactions taking place in those areas. So if you think about some of the, like, um, you know, if you're applying for a job and you want to display educational credentials or something like that, and we're a long way from that point at the moment. But, uh, but if you think of the sophistication of some of those interactions, which have all got to be hidden from the public, you could have a situation where, uh, you know, a website or a service provider or a shop is asking for a certain set of credentials. I have lots of different credentials which would satisfy those, but they come from different issuers. 
uh, some of those issuers are trusted by the website, some aren't. There's a lot of backward and forward there to get to this set of credentials which are acceptable and can be checked uh, by the other side. But that's, that's a matter of milliseconds between smartphones and, uh, you know, it's not a, you know, we should want that degree of complexity because we want the granularity of the privacy that it delivers into the mass market. We shouldn't be afraid of that complexity under the hood especially as if in industry we've agreed on the ceremonial uh, level. I hate to keep going back to that word, but I can't think of a better word for it, Jane. It's like, but you know what I mean? Like, it has to be this common ceremony that everybody uh, sort of takes part in. And it's our job as the industry to make sure that works as an infrastructure, but not so that anybody using it has to use any part of it. So I know that's quite a high bar, but I think it's reasonable to try that. So, uh, so just to sum up then, what's the situation? The situation is bad, fraud and the scandemic out of control. Uh, why am I so optimistic then? Well, because we see these two developments. We see uh, passwordless authentication going into the mass market with pass keys and things like that. Um, and we see the technologies of self-sovereign identity. I'm, as you say, I'm skeptical about self-sovereign identity itself. Really, you know, what, what say, the, you know, the, the Bitcoin, they, they, you should be your own bank and look after it. Like, no sane person wants to be their own bank, right? I, like, I really want this situation where here's my life savings and it depends on this key I've got on a USB stick, which I have to wrap in tin foil and put in a biscuit tin and bury in my back garden somewhere. Um, obviously, I bury two biscuit tins in my back garden because I don't want the criminals to know which one's got the real USB stick in. I'm, I'm, thoughtful about security. Well, that's, that's, that's absolutely mad. Nobody's going to do that. So, so therefore, the opportunity for the banks to step in, to coordinate, to use the technologies of self-sovereign identity in a custodial self-sovereign identity environment is very real. But for that to work in the mass market, we need ceremony. And so, you know, that's my appeal to, to you and your team, Jane which is who is it that can coordinate um, the work necessary on this ceremony, uh, which must not be based on what technologists think. This is where we need the uh, anthropologists and artists and the other people to provide input to that. But I genuinely think, I, th I genuinely think it's doable and that's why there's an optimistic context to what I've been saying this morning. So I, I hope you think that's a practical way forward, but thank you. Kia ora Dave, thank you very much. Uh, Namahi nui. Uh, I really like um, your idea of ceremony. I was really taken with that. And I think in um, the payments world, didn't we used to just call it payments ubiquity? We, we taught people how to use a card, how to swipe it. Then we taught them how to dip it. Now we've taught them how to tap it. So it's just that, what did Rachel say yesterday, that kind of that trust leap into tap to prove. I, I, I was thinking about this uh, actually a few days ago. I was in... I was in um, I was in New York and I went into, so, so in the UK and I, here as well, you go into a shop to buy something, like the terminals, like you have the same symbol, it's in the same, you know, you, the, the, you know the, the amount comes up in the, you know exactly what to do, you know exactly where to put your phone and tap and you walk out. And I went to, I won't say the store, but I went to a store in the US, I ran in to sort of buy something, I go to the point of sale terminal, I literally have no idea what to do, there's no queues. I don't know where the contactless tap part is. It's asking me something about, you know, do I want to join their loyalty scheme or something, which I had no interest in. And you had to press a button to get past that before you could just go and tap and all that sort of thing. So, so we kind of take for granted that the ceremony around tap to pay is very well established. Um, but actually it isn't everywhere, you know. But mm. yeah, but that's where the idea comes from. And that's why Jerry's thing about tap to prove caught my imagination, yeah. like as part of a ceremony. Yeah, absolutely, because we've put so much effort into that cards environment, yeah. and as we move into maybe more account-to-account -account space or, you know, d using digital wallets, that, yeah, that, I was, I was quite taken with that. So when you Thank become, you. what did you say you were going, you really want to be? Not the godfather or the global <laughs> godfather. You want to be the self-attested dictator of uh, yeah, all dicta things. Dictator for life would yeah. suit me. And you have been... Um, your call to action for the banks for many years to be the custodians of um, people's identity, their Look, trusted, I just, they... I, I can't prove it to you with bar charts or spreadsheets, Jane, but I, I just feel that the banks are the natural 
place for this discussion and to take it forward. It's not even an 80-20 solution. Like in New Zealand, it would be a 98-2 solution. Like if the banks would sort this out, almost everybody in New Zealand would then have the problem solved for them. Um, and and why do you think it's been a bit harder? I would, some of the language is pretty hard. So when you were talking about the technology, what is it? Cryptographic, blah, blah. And Counterintuitive then, cryptography. Yeah, no, look, mean, I, those, are my, those are hard concepts. Yes, yes, I'm not, around, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sidestep that. I mean, yeah. I think it's reasonable to, to actually blame the industry, e.g. people like me, um, for not being effective at, at communicating these new possibilities to, to people. It, it is sort of complicated how that stuff works, but I'm sure we can find better ways of explaining it to the, to the regulators and the legislators. There is, a, there is a sort of paradox if, you know, at the political level, if, if you're trying to go for economic growth, which in the modern economy means growth of the information economy, the data economy, for that to happen, you need data to be flowing around the system. You need data to be used to do that. So, and there is a, if you don't understand these new cryptographic techniques, that, that's paradoxical. Like, how can I share more data and yet keep people's data private? That seems like you're trying to square a circle. But actually, with these new technologies, it's not. The ability to move around the proofs about data while keeping people's personal information safely locked up, in, in my view, in the bank, um, I think actually opens up some amazing new yeah. possibilities. So It's so important, isn't it? Because as you said, frauds on the rise, scams, you know, who do people trust? And it's so important, you know, for Aotearoa, for anywhere around the world, but particularly the people, you know, obviously close to our heart here in Aotearoa, really want to help them move into this digital age and, and well, support we them to, to, we want to participate. Them. Yeah. But you must have had the same experience as me when you're walking down the street and you get a phone call saying, hello, this is your bank. You know, we just want to check, is this transaction? I'm like, who the hell are you? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just because your number comes up on that doesn't mean anything. Anyone can spoof phone numbers and SMSs and stuff like that. So we need something more radical to move Maybe forward. just when the debt collectors start knocking on your door, you <laughs> might you might then know that you were actually meant to pay that bill or your VAT. <laughs> that's, that's true. That was actually a real example. I did delete that because I thought it was a scam. And it turned out I was overdue paying my VAT. So, so I'm, I'm going to go there. What about... Um, Twitter has obviously <laughs> had a ownership change recently. Yeah, that's and, an interesting example, and, and, isn't it? But you know, if Elon gets his way around the proof of personhood, you know, how would you see that interacting with or, or payments industries or financial services around this digital? Well, that's thing, that's. We? I think that's a funny example, isn't it? Because you know, sometimes um, you know things come out of sort of unexpected directions. Uh, you know, the, they have this, you know, IBM didn't invent the mini computer, DEC didn't invent the PC, Microsoft didn't invent Google, Google didn't invent Facebook, Facebook didn't invent Twitter, you know, it goes along like that. Yeah. Um, what if the solution comes from a very unexpected place? I mean, I know it sounds weird, but, um, but, but imagine Twitter does become, you know, they've, they've done strong KYC, they don't at the moment, but you could imagine they do it through banks with open banking. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, your, your Twitter handle becomes something that's actually real and valuable. Something that people can send money to and you can send money from. Well, then next time I go to log into, you know, I don't know, match.com or something, instead of them doing the KYC, why don't they just use the Twitter account as proof of personhood? And then suddenly, if people are using social media accounts as proof of personhood, those could expand in their functionality and the banks could be bypassed by that sort of thing. So I, it's a funny example to talk about, but it's a serious point. You know, sometimes things just come out of a different direction. Yeah. What if it turns out that, I don't know, imagine there's a Disney app that you need to do age verification for, for watching content and suddenly people start using that in other places. I mean, it's interesting to think about. So I, Twitter is a fabulous example for exploring this. Yeah. And um, I... You may have just answered this, but um, I've got a question come here, come through from our very own Russell Bryant at BNZ asking, um, the minister announced this morning the consumer data right for open banking, and um, Russell asked, the newly announced this morning consumer data right direction champions ease of bank movement, how might that align with digital custodianship through a bank? And you, I, I mean, obviously you've touched on that. No, I, no, so, no I, it's, a, it's a really important question. And, and I don't mean that in a patronizing sense. I mean that genuinely. So, and that's because if we live in a world where the transaction fees associated with payments are essentially going to zero, 
and we need strategic alternatives for value-added services around those kind of things. The um, custodianship of digital assets, if, you, if, if you're as skeptical as about self-custodianship as I am, um, custodianship of digital assets would be a serious bank business. Of course, I, you know, my favorite NFTs, as well as my pension plan and my tokens for lumps of gold or whatever, of course I would prefer to have those under bank custody than have the responsibility of looking at it for myself. So it, quite so I think that's a really serious business. And yeah, I think for, 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 for banks, it's a viable alternative to some of the transaction fees from payments, which they're going to lose anyway because of you know, account to account payments and all these kind of things. Yeah. Okay, Dave. Um, just last question, if past keys, as you're saying, are successful, what comes next? Um, I'm, very, I'm very interested in the evolution of the sort of passive biometrics. So this idea that, um, you know, so, so, so when I go to log into something, I've got the phone in my hand, and I actually don't have to do anything or press, because actually the phone, it, this is how Dave holds the phone, this is how Dave presses the keys. This is in a place where Dave normally goes. This is doing something Dave normally does. You didn't even, like, don't bother with your, like, I know it's Dave, you know. And so, so this idea that you kind of, it's kind of ambient authentication where, where the environment knows that it's you, not because of invasive retinal scanning biometrics and chips in my head and this sort of thing, but just because this is how I hold a phone. This is how I walk around, you know, sort of thing. I, I'm interested in that. It's, it's not quite ready for prime time yet, but it's getting close. Mm. So, so pretty soon, you know, you won't need to do the face ID or anything because the phone will just know it's you. And yeah, that makes it even more seamless. Excellent. Thank you. Well, um, I know you've been coming down here for a while and I think you started with saying no one listens and no one pays attention. But there's quite a few people um, online this morning listening and paying attention. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a world of possibility, but obviously with the point our theme of reframing the future, we really do need to be, you know, really having a really hard, strong look at all of this. As you were saying, fraud's on the rise. We have to protect customers. How do we do that? Ceremony um, is how we do it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm um, Kia ora koutou, nā mahi nui, kia koe, Dave. Thank you for being with us today. And um, safe travels back to the UK or wherever in the globe you're going to head off to after this. Thank you very much, Jane. It was a pleasure to be here. Kia ora. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for um, spending some time with Dave and I this morning. We have our next session with um, Brett King, and Steve will be back to introduce him at 11 o'clock. I'd like to just put a final shout-out to our um, education partner, Pay Ed, and to all of our sponsors um, for The Point 2022. And I will be back this afternoon talking about real-time payments. And uh, kai kite anō, see you soon.